Board to present Dr. Charles Baserman from University of California, Santa Barbara. Dr. Baserman is a prominent figure in the writing across the curriculum movement. He has contributed significantly to the establishment of writing as a research field. He carries on his research on the study and teaching of writing with a focus on discursive genres and the rhetoric of science. Some of his most important publications are a theory of literal action, generos textuales, tipificación y actividad, and shaping written knowledge. Thank you, Charles, for giving your insights about the studies of writing. Uh, thank you, and uh, I'm so glad to be speaking. Uh, I was just in Argentina recently and uh, before the pandemic and uh, uh, many a number of times I've been in Argentina and uh, have come to uh, love the country. And the teachers yeah, yeah, yeah. and all the teachers <laughs> in the country too. That's good. <laughs> well, Charles, our first question or the first thing we'd like to know is what do you think about what is the difference between a writing approach and a linguistic approach to text production? Yeah, so uh, I think this is a very important issue because uh, most of the experiences uh, and training that teachers uh, of writing in, um, in Argentina and in most of Latin America have had has been through a linguistics approach, um, which offers a lot, but is a very different approach from the writing approach, which offers different things. Um, so linguists, uh, first I'll talk about linguists and then applied linguistics. Now, linguistics is primarily about the forms of language, um, how, they, uh, how they come about, um, what are their patterns, um, they document different languages and different dialects. Um, they find the different systems that uh, help explain and help you understand the systematicity and um, the variations. Um, and some versions of linguistics also look at um, what might be underlying causes of that systematicity. Um, where does that systematicity come from? Um, uh, it uh, looks across dialects, but it also looks across uh, groups uh, groups within uh, within those languages and dialects, and uh, sometimes looks at registers and um, other organizing uh, aspects of it and other other organizing principles of that systematicity. Applied linguistics then. Um, one of the main areas it applies to is language teaching and to help students um, produce those forms uh, appropriately and correctly um, within their various situations um, they are uh, engaged in. And uh, those situations are often seen through forms of systematicity. So uh, such as um, within which dialect they're speaking, within which language, uh, teaching a foreign language or non-native language, um, teaching um, uh, uh, them to participate in specialized groups within it, such as scientific communication, um, where they might be concerned with genres, styles, um, registers, but again, seen as systems. What, what, is, what are the forms, system, uh, systematicity of forms? What are the forms that you will need to produce? So um, uh, they help students recognize, produce systematically um, uh, th these forms uh, uh, effectively in the sense that they will not be seen as incorrect or improper in their choices. Um, okay. Writing studies takes different tack. Of course, we write through language. And the more we understand about the systematicity of language and the variations, the more effectively we use it. 
that's writers work with language but writing uses those languages to purposes um, to uh, build effective situation appropriate meanings that carry out the interests um, and meanings of the writer so um, and we'll talk a little bit about that with a, a, few, a further question, but um, writing is practice oriented, not oriented towards the forms, but about how you, how you write um, or how you teach writing um, or how does writing play out in the world to carry on various social, economic, governmental institutional practices, right? So how we can participate in those practices. Um, so uh, at one level, teaching of writing uh, is concerned with how do you find the meanings that you want to make? How do you understand the situations you are part of and and form those meanings in a way appropriate to those situations. How, how can you be effective in this uh, with various groups of people and within various activity systems? Um, how can you, uh, to go back to your impulses, how can you recognize your motives, the meaning gists? And then as you move outwards, how do, you, um, how do those intersect with the uh, various people you're communicating with? Um, that, um, yes, and um, what kind of resources do you have? Um, how do you then go about the process of turning those gists and impulses and use those resources um, to create your meanings through various activities even before you begin writing, long before you begin writing. Um, but when you're first starting to formulate ideas, but then when you start to produce preliminary documents and you start to draft and start to revise, um, how do you then make those doc the things you're writing more persuasive for the situation? But also, how can those, what you're writing, not just be persuasive within given situations, but how does your, what you're writing, how can that change the situation? At the very least, because you're adding your new statement, but all your statement can hybridize, can bring other resources into a situation. It can transform situations. Um, it can uh, make new meanings relevant, of course, within the expect or dealing with the expectations of the groups you're communicating with, which then also leads to uh, how do you exert power in with through your statements? How does your statement um, serve as an activity or um, as an action? within that situation um, and therefore carry that out. And how do you evaluate how effective your actions have been? Um, what are the results? Um, there, there are also questions of how do you reflect on all these processes, both your production processes and the larger social processes, um, and which also include um, collaborative it's not just an individual production but there's collaborations and productions there's all kinds of feedback and responses uh, and how do you understand um, those um, and and again use all of these to help guide your future actions because it's practical and it's to help students also gain this power of writing within their lives so that's how writing differs. It's not, the forms are something that's used, but it's not the end of the game. The end of the game 
is communicating, acting, um, having having more power within your lives um, through the act of writing. So um, I think that's the basic difference in the approaches. Um, and um, let me, uh, a writing approach tends to develop within first language uh, situations um, and linguistic approaches in second language situations because of course you're learning foreign languages or different languages, uh, different specialized. Uh, one of the areas where, well, but some within applied linguistics that are not being purely linguistic in their approach, they start to adopt these more production oriented concerns. Um, and so there's uh, been some meeting along that line. Another place where it's tended to meet is in um, specialized languages like scientific writing, because there are both, even if you are a native speaker and of the dominant dialect, right? You are not necessarily, um, learning to uh, to produce legal texts or scientific texts unless of course your family you your parents are a bunch of lawyers or scientists and at the dinner table you to be heard you have to speak that language right but um but there are novel forms they're novel for most people um as they uh uh and so but they they need to go, if they're going to be successful participants in those fields, they need to go beyond the forms as well to create appropriate effective meanings, um, carry out actions with, within that. So scientific writing is not just following the forms of the genre, but it's making a contribution um, in a persuasive way. Um, th that's something new, you know, people don't read uh, stuff that's been published before, right? And you don't get published if you just write stuff that everybody knows, right? So, uh, so those are areas where it meets. And also, uh, within communicative approaches in applied linguistics, right? When you're trying to draw on students' impulse to communicate and to communicate within different situations. There also, there's a kind of, a little bit of an intersection with um, uh, composition approaches, writing approaches. Let me just say something about the word composition. Um, composition is not my favorite word for my field, but it is a long-standing word, and it has uh, a it has a lot of meaning in it. Um, I like writing studies because it's even more encompassing. But composition puts the emphasis not on the language, but on the process of composing, making something. Writers make some make things. Um, the same way music composers make things, right? Or um, artists make things, graphic artists, they make things, and those things are communicative, right? So um, that word composition is, is pretty good. <laughs> not, not my most favorite word for my field, but it is a pretty good word. <laughs> okay, so, any questions about this before we go on to the next question? No, I, I, I don't have any questions about this topic. We can think a little about the future now, and maybe you can, you can speak a little about from your perspective, uh, from a writing studies perspective, uh, which topics do you consider should be investigated in the next 10 years? Okay, so uh, 
Yeah, so I have five areas which I've uh, noted down. Uh, some are very futuristic and some are immediate and right now. Um, and I think maybe the most futuristic one, I'll start with that, but it's maybe the most surprising uh, to think of as futuristic. Um, when I said futuristic, you're probably going to think, you're probably thinking, you might have been thinking that I was talking about technologies. Uh, but that's not it. Actually, technologies are part of some of the most present and immediate and recognizable ones, even though technologies will be transforming. Um, uh, I'll go into that in a minute. But so for a number of years, I've been saying to young people, uh, if you have a taste for uh, neuroscience, writing is a really interesting place to go to. Um, and if you have an interest in writing. So if you're at the intersection of this, because writers use their brains <laughs> and they use their whole neural systems, including out to the fingers when uh, right in the production end of it. So there's a lot going on inside. And it's been largely speculative, uh, this intersection until now. Um, but we're starting to get tools that may help us understand over coming decades a little bit better. We have some tools that are starting to give us a little bit now, but they're still pretty crude. Um, but, and I even think for neuroscientists, um, writing is one of the most interesting nuts to crack because it's one of the most difficult and complicated things people do. Um, writers struggle real hard and they spend a lot of time thinking about what they're doing, right? And they process lots of information in order to do it. Um, and they could be working on a project for years. So there's been a, a couple of studies. These are a long standing now, just and again on the crude level that um, okay, these are studies about time delay. Um, so if you're playing chess and you're a grandmaster and you're uh, really concentrating and a light goes on and you have to press a buzzer, you, it takes a while for you to see the light and press the buzzer. And the stronger a player you are and the more focused you are, the longer it takes. So it's a, it's a measure of level of concentration. Well, writers are right up there with chess grandmasters as to how concentrated they are. But chess grandmasters even only, uh, there's a limited set of possibilities on the board, a limited set of information and uh, uh, a kind of, even though there are inf infinite possibilities, it's still a kind of limited problem. Whereas, um, and, you know, a game might go over three hours, right? And then the game is over. Writers, again, may be working on projects for years, drawing on tremendous in, uh, resources, going, getting more information, talking to people, um, reading more books, right? Um, uh, doing experiments, right? gathering data. So writing is one of the most difficult and complex things that people do. So from a neuroscientist point of view, I think it's really interesting. And it has to do with all your senses, all the ways you get information, or, or it, it's a total body experience, even more than chess, which is, again, limited in its focus. So, uh, the more we know about how people do it, the better we can do it ourselves, the more we can manage our own processes and the more we can help develop students' processes. So that's 
but that's the most distant one because our tools for effective uh, understanding of it are limited. And there's a one fundamental obstacle in that um, brain activity is not thought. It's the outer shell of thought. It's the physical manifestation of thought. Right? And that, that's, that makes it uh, problematic. But nonetheless, we can get a lot more information about that shell of thought, uh, uh, which might at some point lead us into thought or might demystify even what thought and meaning are. That's, I mean, I have a hunch that actually they're not so different. Um, that we tend to have mystical ideas about meaning. But that's way out in the future. Um, let me... Um, a, a, oh, I don't, this one's not so distant, although the uh, neurocognitive elements of it could help with it. Um, but it's, let's say, less developed as an area and a little bit stranger to teachers of writing, but I'm going to bring it in, is atypicality, uh, disability. Uh, people with different sets of abilities notably learn to write in different ways. So if you are deaf and you don't have um, uh, you don't have the same phonological input that other people do. You have uh, you have to learn to go about uh, learning alphabetic languages differently, which then mean that your formulation of language and the creation of meaning is done in a different way. Um, if sign is your primary means of formulating meaning, that also means it's a different process. Right? Uh, so it's, I mean, this term differently abled, I think is really accurate. It's not just a PC term. It means that people are living under different sets of conditions. And those different sets of conditions, first, it's, it's important for us to help, help these various populations, right? Uh, that um, uh, it's actually quite miraculous as, as people who've lived extremely marginalized lives are, are the possibilities of, of life open up for them. And this happened just in recent decades. Um, it's tremendous. It's it's a tremendous transformation for them, and an enrichment for our societies. But also, <laughs> it tells us it it disrupts many of our assumptions about how people do things and what what is, because again, thinking about it makes us more aware. Just let's say the deaf example it makes us more much more aware of. Well, how much is phonology tied to, to the process of writing? And what are the phonological processes or sub-phonological processes that we use in our writing? These are open questions. Then you think about autism where there's some disruption of social engagement, right? We don't, again, we don't understand that, but that can open up tremendous understanding about uh, typicality. But what most opens up is that everybody is atypical. There is no typical writer. And so atypicality, sort of marked atypicality is only the leading edge of understanding the individuality of our writing development. So I think that's a really interesting area. There are only, and most of the studies in, that, in this area are really crude that people with problems have problems, kind of <laughs> was the first round of this, <laughs> that, oh, uh, uh, people with hearing loss are slower to learn spelling, duh. 
um, but not really getting into in, into these questions. And the number of people who are working with autism and writing are a handful. Uh, just um, there's a, a actually there is a lot more about deafness, but it still doesn't go quite as deep as we want because there's a very robust educational community around deafness. Um, so, uh, so that's another area. It's a little bit more distant, getting a little bit closer. Um, that um, and uh, this one's still a little bit um, away, in that. Um, hmm. Well, let's. I'm. I'm not going to put this on a timeline now. Um, but there's. How do individuals change and transform and develop as writers over a lifetime, and what are the consequences for the way they think? There's a new area. Um, I've done some publishing and and then been trying to stir the pot on this about lifespan development of writing. But that's also lifespan development of consciousness because the kind of writing we do relates to the kind of thinking we do. Now, some people have the hypothesis that the thinking comes first and the writing is an epiphenomena. I tend to think the, that they're highly interactive and it's more like 90% the other way. Um, and that uh, the more advanced forms of thought have embedded within them highly literate practices. Or, I mean, if they are certain kinds of things we call thought. I mean, uh, soccer players think a lot. Uh, they use their, their, they have highly developed, um, they have highly developed ways of responding to sit, not just uh, immediately responding, but sizing up and perceiving what's going on Right, but um, so which are built around the field, the ball, the other players, right? It's not writing; it's other kinds of um, things that come to their attention. But for literature, philosophy, science, law, those are all essentially writing activities they are mediated and come into being through writing, right? So those forms of thought are deeply intertwined with writing. Um, and how does that develop over the lifespan? The same kid who at three years old or four years old is scribbling with a crayon, that same kid 60 years later is um, a professor or a member of the court, right? Uh, uh, is a social leader, right? How do they get from one place to the other? And what are the transformations that go on? If you just think about yourself um, and uh, when did you st start, not just start to learn the basics, but even as you learn the basics, um, then if you work, well, you've all worked with some kind of um, students, right? Every student in your class is different and they're different writers. At whatever age you've been working with them by age eight, but they become more differentiated the further you get on. The hot, even, even as, even if you're teaching, well, it's many of you, I guess, are doctoral students, right? In your doctoral seminars, everybody is saying really different things. Even if you're listening to your professor and trying to live in your professor's world, um, everybody is saying different things. You're reading different stuff, you write different papers. If you handed in the same paper to your professor, they would say, oh, I don't know, we got a problem here, right? So you're only already highly differentiated and you have, all, I hope you have good arguments in your seminars and you recommend books to each other. 
um, and you comment from different perspectives on your papers to each other, right? And some of you, and depending on the professor, you may have more and more leeway to bring in more of your difference, right? So um, how do you get to be that way? Right? And, and how does that develop over your lifespan and where's it gonna go um, in the ensuing years in your, in your own life, right? You have ambitions. You don't know, even if you fulfill your greatest ambitions, what are going to be those brilliant papers and books that you write? If you knew now what they were, would be, you can write them now, right? But if you actually, if you can write them now, then your next book's gonna be something totally different, way beyond that. It's a path, which is you're being built through your experiences now as writers. And each, each step you take leads you to another step into another place which you could not fully anticipate. And it's building skills that will allow you to see and say more. Okay, so lifespan development changes that occur in the person. Um, okay, a general issue which has been going on for a while now, and that's why I'm putting, putting it towards uh, the end of this timeline, um, uh, but it's still, there's so much to be learned, is to understand the various activity systems that people participate through writing and in which genres serve as mediating uh, the relationships. Um, Writing, well, this gets to the next question, but writing is infrastructural to most institutions, social arrangements. Um, so how, so if we wanna understand how to participate in those, we need to understand the role writing takes in them. We need to understand how these systems are organized, um, how people are effective in creating effective action um, within them um, and how certain kinds of writing actions can transform, can not just express an interest, but can transform them. And then how do you go about doing work within those settings? Um, what kind of resources are available and used? What are the underlying economics and institutional conditions um, and the histories that set up these current moments and the opportunities to interact. And this is to help people participate in them, um, to understand, uh, analyze them, diagnose what's going on, and, and then also say, is this system working well? Does it need another kind of genre, another kind of communicative arrangement? Or do other people need to be brought into this and how would that transform it? So it goes beyond just understanding where you are and what you right now to seeing how, how can we make this work better as a communicative activity system? Um, so this is where I see technology entering in because technology is already built into many of these systems and is currently transforming these systems and will continue to transform them. That doesn't mean that it's technologically determined, but technology provides a medium of action within that. And often technology can provide opportunities for change because if technology sort of shake things up, you can, you can sneak things in with the new technologies. Um, a simple example that's happening um, currently. Okay, I've long felt that um, that new technologies provide opportunities for shaking up the classroom, providing uh, at the very least, students aren't stuck with a single textbook. They have a lot of source resources. Um, but it also gives them more opportunity to formulate, to communicate with each other. Um, it students are empowered because they themselves are 
uh, located in wi wider networks. Um, well, right now, as learning has gone virtual, and everybody's on a Zoom classroom, it becomes very obvious which teachers are still only engaged in one-way communication and text and tests. Right? They they give video lectures and the students take their quizzes and they try to replicate that, but so many more it gives so much more opportunities for various forms of interaction um uh and uh lateral uh work among students um teacher observation even of uh whether you want to lurk in the, the breakout rooms or not <laughs> you know but it, it's just um what was called a while ago the flipped classroom and people are still calling it that um in teaching of writing, we've been doing flipped classrooms since for since I've been in the business, right? That you know the classroom has all been about interaction and uh, interaction over student papers, um, but in other fields, um, there's a lot more of that going on, right? And uh, so it's not necessary. The technology doesn't make it necessary, but it makes it easier. And the disruption occurred in traditional patterns also is the opportunity to smuggle more of that in. Um, on the other hand, I think people, and I wouldn't call it waste a lot of time, but use a lot of time chasing the latest technology and just entranced by it. I think it's more important to understand the underlying dynamics and then seeing where the new technologies enter into that. But you're always going to be chasing, and especially the pe the change, technological change. You know, it's the pace of it is just so rapid that you're always going to be chasing what's happening next week. Um, all right, so you got to be really strategic about what what's getting at something fundamental and what work won't become dated. Um, I'm just thinking of an example now, and um, oh, about. 20 years ago, 20, 20, well, actually, it's time passes. About 30 years ago, um, I was at Georgia Tech, and the latest thing there was hypertext stacks. And everybody was about, wow, how you can use hypertext stacks and creating those. People spent a lot of energy in it. Now, there was something long lasting, which is access to complex of information and making judgments uh, among different sorts of information. And, um, you know, the internet is uh, a kind of hypertext, an uncontrolled hypertext with many hypertexts within it. So if you were understanding something about how people were making judgments about um, uh, multiple sources or how people navigate within complex uh, domains, uh, uh, rich source domains, maybe that would be something that's a little bit more fundamental. So if you're into looking at uh, technologies, really think about what is more fundamental and what's likely to have a little bit of staying power versus just documenting, oh, here's the cool thing. What are students doing with this cool thing now? Um, or how can I build a cool thing? Right, but just a lot of energy goes into that. Um, not that people shouldn't build cool things. Right? Okay. Um, now there's, and this is the last one. Something that's um, a special hobby horse of mine. I've got a number of hobby horses I've talked about, but um, I think is very important i think there's only been a limited kind of work in this um and this is a question i guess one way is understand it's the matrix are we in the matrix question okay so uh or what is the status of science question uh 
So what we've been talking about are communicative worlds. Humans make language, whatever our predispositions are to doing it, and whatever other forms other animals do. Language as we know it is made by humans and shared by humans as our graphic representations and all the other media, TV, videos, right? That they're made by humans to be shared by other humans. They are just representations. They're all made up. They're not real. Um, they're not, not real in the sense of they are not they are not necessarily beyond anything by themselves, uh, except what they are. You know, they're, uh, but they, we also treat them as though they tell us about the world, the social world we live in. Well, they are the medium of a lot of the social world we live in, but do they tell us other than the words people make up? Are they just novels? that, um, you know, fictions we tell about each other. Um, do scientific articles actually tell us about the world or are they just power relations, by, power moves by scientists? Um, the earlier versions of Latour were kind of like this about scientists aggregating power for themselves. Um, or do they tell us about the world in some way? Now, the early version of the science wars was more, <laughs> I, which I kind of walked through in my life, um, were really kind of simplistically. Is it just postmodern representation? Or is it about the world and, but well, then we just write up this stuff. Is it, right? Um, I don't think it's either, right? That somehow the world gets into our text through certain procedures, right? And gets in, in to varying degrees and in various ways with various accountability. In our politics, this then becomes the question of facts and fake facts. Again, facts are just something that humans make up in language in a certain way, but some of them bear a closer resemblance to worlds outside of the words or that set of words and others are um, more, uh, less reliable. Uh, they are more just the stories that we've told each other or others tell. Um, there's, uh, Okay, I'll talk about Ludwig Fleck was a, an early philosopher of science who really that was getting at this problem um, almost a hundred years ago, 90 years ago. And he said there are um, active, culturally active elements uh, to how we represent things, that we have certain thought styles and representational styles, the way we go about things, but then there's passive constraints. So if you say that, well, I'm going to measure hardness by geological hardness, by which thing scratches the other. The scratching thing is harder than the thing that gets scratched. Okay, that's a culturally determined definition. On the other hand, we don't have control over which will be the scratcher and which will be the scratched, right? So, oh, diamonds are harder than coal, right? So that's kind of where I position this, right? And he says one other thing that what makes science interesting culturally is that it actively seeks these passive constraints. Unlike, let's say, somebody in a cult who says the world is ending tomorrow and tells a story, but and then it turns out tomorrow happens and day after tomorrow happens. He really didn't want to test that, but 
he's got to live with it. He's got to make up another story about why it didn't end. And it's actually a meta a metaphorical tomorrow, um, right? He's got to change the representational system. Whereas um, science would say, oh, that, it didn't end. I guess we were wrong, right? And they would set up an experiment, which is like, Okay, we'll put up a clock and we'll see when tomorrow is. <laughs> and we'll see whether we're here. Right? So it actively seeks these passive constraints. So, so that's the core problematic I find really interesting. How is it that different fields go about being held accountable and being constrained in its representations? So as your method that, oh yeah, I saw it in a dream. Or your method is I built a large cyclotron and spent all this money and uh, we got a large team together and we set up these experiments, right? That's, there's a difference. And we would say, we would evaluate the quality of their knowledge based on what we, how we evaluate their methods or touching the world and bringing the world into their representations. So not a, there's been some work on just which are, which a better way to draw a graph once you've got the data. But there's not been a lot about how do you get the data, right? Now, that, again, that falls into the area of methodology of, of a, a lot of fields, uh, that that's what they call it. Um, other fields don't call it anything, but uh, they do have their methods, right? And they may reflect on how on their methods. Um, it's also what they pay attention to. So another example of this is, um, and this is more how they calculate. Uh, so and one thing that interested me was global warming and uh, I just noticed we have 10 minutes left, so I, I've got another appointment at noon. Um, but uh, which industry noticed global warming or paid attention to global warming first? Actually, we were two of them. Um, for most businesses, climate change is a small cost in the short term, right? And they calculate by the quarter or by the year to keep their stock prices up. And they have an obligation to keep their stock prices up and to make earnings in the foreseeable future. And they, even if they've got long sighted, a long sight in business is a long horizon is five years or so. Uh, beyond that's hard to calculate. And um, it's not consequential. So the worst that happens is that your insurance costs go up. That, you know, if there's some damage, you get insured, your insurance rates go up. That's a relatively minor cost. Except for the energy industry that said, oh, well, we've got, we collect oil reserves and our business is predicated on the sales of fossil fuels. So it's gonna be, um, you know, but in the short term, you know, regulation about climate change is, is gonna be very expensive. So we're going to calculate. So we, so um, we have to stop, or we have to work our way around this idea about climate change, and we're going to get people not to pay attention to it or distrust the idea of it because it's going to destroy our business model. The other industry is the insurance industry, who's used to thinking in hundred-year terms, actuarial terms, and they know their business model depends on what's gonna happen a hundred years from now. So they were, so those are the two industries that hired a lot of climate sciences early. One to um, protect itself from, uh, from regulation and, the, and to tell alternative stories that will um, diffuse regulation. And the other, because to calculate, oh, we're gonna to have to pay for all this damage so uh, uh, we better figure out what's going on. And uh, they also were, the, the insurance industry also was also the first to say, governments must do something about climate change. 
it's really interesting. So it's about how, what kind of things get represented, how do they go about being represented and then they're entering into the calculations of the field. So I think it's really important uh, set of issues. Okay, on to the last question and then I've got a, 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 another meeting, sorry. Yes, we, in a certain way, you have answered our last question that has to do with the value of writing studies and writing education um, to society. If you want to add anything else uh, about this topic, we'd be glad to hear in the time but we have. I, I just want to pull it together. So writing is the hidden infrastructure of modernity. It is how we organize things at a different, at a distance. Our lives, um, it's one of the most important, if not to me, the most important reason that we live lives differently now than we lived 5,000 years ago. Um, it allowed the formation of modern economies. It allowed the formation of modern governments, um, all the bureaucracies, um, modern, uh, all forms of knowledge and science, um, uh, modern religions, belief systems, um, all of these things are held together by writing. And even the soccer, the way we play soccer, um, all right, is, is it, these are large corporations um, with embedded in media and now related to media corporations and they have rule books and regulations and right <laughs> that's just that saturated uh, everything we do is saturated with writing so given that the more we understand about writing the more we understand our world the better we can participate within it the more we can change it the people who have high degrees of literacy, okay, people who don't have high degrees of literacy are the victims of society. They don't have, they can't participate within it. And if their literacy is just readers, as readers, they are more uh, observers. Writing is how you get your voice, how you establish your presence, meaning, value right, within the systems. And it's also how you can transform those systems to make the world a better place, a more habitable place uh, for you and for others. So, um, so that's, I mean, writing is big stuff. Um, we think as writing teachers, we're like off in a little corner, we're often not very appreciated within our institutions, um, within our disciplines, uh, oh yeah, well, these people, we mark a lot of papers. I think this is really noble work. Uh, it's, uh, we're dealing with some of the most important thing. Now, you know, right now in, in our world, I mean, there are obviously people who are dealing with immediate problems and I don't want to downplay the value of medicine, the importance of economy, you know, all these steps that are really pressing uh, on us, nor the people who are engaged in uh, uh, policy work. Um, <laughs> and the more literate and educated ones tend to operate a little bit differently than the others because they have a much wider view uh, <laughs> than others, or ones that seem to have a narrow business view, uh, only see things in certain limited terms where those who are able to um, take in a lot of information and form statements, operate in a different way. So these are really important with them very immediate consequences. But in terms of empowering all people to have their say within all those systems, writing is core. And into the reformulation and reflection of those systems and improvement of those systems, writing is the core core. So people may not appreciate what we do, but we all know what we do. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Charles, for your enlightening answers. We are like, <laughs> we can stop listening to you. Thank you very much for your time. We know you have to leave now. So 
thank you a lot for your time, for your answers, for your insights. And if you have any follow-up questions or from the seminar, uh, from the com conference, uh, please contact me and uh, I will do my best to uh, elaborate or respond to uh, any challenges you might give me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll, yeah. we'll keep in touch. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very Good much, luck. Professor. Good luck. Thank you. Bye now. Bye.